We read from the Holy Scriptures, Ephesians chapter 5. Paul's letter to the Ephesians chapter 5. It is our desire to deal with this practical part of the letter of Paul to the Ephesians and especially to the lives and callings of wives and husbands, children and parents, masters and servants, in this, to use the occasion of baptism to do that. We realize that we are starting in the middle of the practical part of this letter. The Apostle wants us to know that there is a, a walk, a walk that must be fit or become, that's the word of Titus 1, 2 verse 1, that fits or becomes, harmonizes with the teaching. He's given the teaching in the first three chapters. Now there must be a walk. So chapter 4, 1, beseech you to walk worthy of the vocation wherewith ye are called. And then he begins to address that in verse 17 of that chapter. This I say therefore and testify in the Lord that ye henceforth walk not as other Gentiles walk in the vanity of their mind. But you, verse 20, have not so learned Christ. You've heard him and be taught, been taught by him as the truth is in Jesus. And that means then, 22, put off the old man. 24, put on the new. He says in chapter 5, this chapter, in verse 2, walk in love. He's going to also say that we must walk, verse 15, circumspectly, carefully. So let's read now this passage, from Ephesians chapter 5, in that light. Be ye therefore followers of God as dear or loved children, and walk in love as Christ also hath loved us, and hath given himself for us, an offering and a sacrifice to God for a sweet-spelling Savior. But fornication and all uncleanness or covetousness, let it not be once named among you, as becometh saints, neither filthiness, nor foolish talking, nor jesting, which are not convenient, but rather giving of thanks. For this ye know, that no whoremonger, nor unclean person, nor covetous man who is an idolater, hath any inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and of God. Let no man deceive you with vain words, for because of these things cometh the wrath of God upon the children of disobedience. Be not ye therefore partakers with them. For ye were sometimes darkness, but now are ye light in the Lord. Walk as children of light. For the fruit of the Spirit is in all goodness and righteousness and truth, proving what is acceptable unto the Lord. And have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness, but rather reprove them. For it is a shame even to speak of those things which are done of them in secret. But all things that are reproved are made manifest by the light. For whatsoever doth make manifest is light. Wherefore he saith, Awake thou that sleepest, and arise from the dead, and Christ shall give thee light. See then that ye walk circumspectly, not as fools, but as wise, redeeming the time, because the days are evil. Wherefore be ye not unwise, but understanding what the will of the Lord is. And here's our text. And be not drunk with wine, wherein is excess, but be filled with the Spirit, speaking to yourselves in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody in your heart to the Lord, giving thanks always for all things unto God and the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, submitting yourselves one to another in the fear of God. 
We stop in our reading of God's Word at that point, praying that He will bless the reading to us. The text is that 18th verse. Be not drunk with wine, wherein is excess, but be filled with the Spirit. A circumspect walk, a careful walk, is one which the Spirit performs within us, one which He equips us to be able so to live and to walk. We want to consider the calling that is ours. Now He's going to give a calling concerning wives husbands, children, parents, fathers particularly, masters, servants. And then he sums it up with the, the armor of the Spirit. But now, right here, this is in a way the beginning of this very practical section about the kind of walk that's implied in our everyday lives. And it's by being filled with the Spirit. It's very interesting that he uses the figure of drinking alcohol, drinking wine, wherein is excess, as a figure that he's going to use when talking about instead being filled with the Spirit. This passage has been used by the church in ages past in the temperance period as a passage that would speak against drunkenness. And while there's no doubt that that application can be used, that's not the heart of the passage. He's using it merely as a figure. There are similarities between filling oneself with wine and filling oneself with the Spirit. And there are dissimilarities. But there's a picture that is given here. That he uses this figure is not only because there are similarities, but also because undoubtedly he knew that on the day of Pentecost, when the Holy Spirit was poured out, the charge was made against the apostles that they were drunk at 9 o'clock in the morning. And that was the reason for the explanation for their conduct. They're speaking of the things of Christ in different tongues. But that was not the case, of course, as Peter denied. But there is that similarity, and he uses that. It's interesting that in wine there is excess. And the word that's translated excess really means the inability to save, not saving. It's squandering. It's abandoning one's money, one's purity, squandering and living in reckless behavior. And that's the very same word Jesus used to describe the activity of the prodigal son in Luke 8, 15. Except there it's translated riotous living, wherein is excess, is a riotous living. And the kind of riotous living that that prodigal son lived in that parable is that he lost all. He spent it on women and he ended up with nothing. He did not save. There was his excess. He lost control. He was without control. The dissimilarity, of course, between wine and the Spirit is because wine, instead of being a stimulant is a depressant. 
And as a depressant, it destroys one's ability to control, control one's thinking, control one's will. We have here a command, a command that's in the present tense. If we want to be the kind of husbands that we ought to be, if we want to be the kind of wives we ought to be, if we want to be the kind of parents, if we want to kind of be the kind of single people, if we want to live in divorce in the right way, if we want to live as a Christian in any way, then it's necessary that we realize where that kind of proper conduct must begin. And it begins with the awareness of the Spirit. The Spirit that takes up His abode within us in regeneration. But His Spirit that in that regenerated heart must take control of our thinking and of our willing. The Spirit must take control of our thinking and of our willing in order for us to be able to apply this to any and every aspect of our life. And it must be applied to every part of our life. He's going to go on in the chapter and speak of the particular things and the particular applications. But every application requires this. Be filled with the Spirit. The present tense refers to a continuous action. Go on being filled. Be perpetually filled. Let it be your constant condition that you are filled with the Spirit. That's the idea. So now that does not refer then to the way we would speak of the Spirit and the way the Apostle has spoken of the Spirit in the past, in other situations. Pentecost, a one-time event, took place on the whole of the church and therefore every member of the church. They were given the Spirit in a measure that was unlike that of the old dispensation, particularly in the amount and in the knowledge they had about the Lord Jesus Christ as the fulfillment of all the prophecies. They understood them and they were able to live them and apply them. That was a one-time event. There's times, too, when this letter in chapter 1, verse 13, he says, you were sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise. And then in chapter 4, verse 30, he says, grieve not, that's a constant action on our part, but grieve not the Spirit whereby ye were sealed unto the day of redemption. That sealing is an activity which God performs. We're passive. That, that's not something we can do. And it's in the past. Sealed. You were sealed. What he's talking about here is something different. Now if we go back into the scriptures and we find similar language, they were filled with the Spirit. We're also going to find that it refers to specific times. There was a man named Bazeliel who God filled with the Spirit and that equipped him, that filling of the Spirit equipped him to be able to be the designer and the architect of the tabernacle. He had the Spirit for that event and then he didn't have it after that. There's also a reference to the Apostle Peter being filled with the Spirit at Pentecost. 
But then he received another filling of the Spirit in chapter 4, verse 8, when he had to speak to the Sanhedrin. And then later on, when he was with the other disciples that were imprisoned, released, they were filled with the Holy Spirit, and they spake the Word of God. Acts 4, verse 28, 31. So there are times when we're filled with the Spirit. This is something different. This is something that characterizes a life. When the disciple or the apostles, disciples, apostles, had to pick deacons, then the first one they selected was a man named Stephen or Stephen. What we read about him is this. They chose Stephen, a man full of faith and of the Holy Ghost. There was something about the way in which he lived his life that evidenced he was full of faith and full of the Holy Ghost, full of the Holy Spirit. Now, he was filled with the Spirit when he died, too, so that he gazed up into heaven and said he saw Christ standing at the throne of God. So there was a specific event in his life, well, at the moment of his death, that was a special time, but the point is is that he was able to have those special times because His life was one characterized by being filled with the Spirit. The same thing is said in Acts 11 about Barnabas. He was a man filled with the Spirit. He was under the influence of the Holy Spirit. The obvious difference between under the influence of wine and the influence of the Spirit is that Wine is a substance. The Spirit is a person. A person. You can sometimes have a conversation with someone and they will tell you about another individual that they greatly admire. For lack of a a better example, Christopher Morris worked on the campaign for the president. And if you had talked with Christopher at any time during that campaign, it would have been obvious to you that he was full of the candidate, Trump. It's all he could talk about. It's all he wanted to talk about. We would have said that of him. He's full of Trump. Well, that's just an example. The Holy Spirit has made an abode in the home, in the heart of every child of God. So that 1 Corinthians 6 says, Your bodies are temples of the Holy Spirit. Does he, does the person of the Spirit so live in your consciousness that you are influenced by him? You are full of him? That's the idea. That's exactly the idea. You are aware of the Spirit. Now, this is, this is the peculiar uniqueness of the Spirit. Jesus tells us in John 15 that the Spirit will guide into all truth. But the Spirit also doesn't speak about Himself. 
The Spirit doesn't want us to think about the Spirit. The Spirit wants us to think about the Lord Jesus Christ. He will tell us all about Him. So to be filled with the Spirit is to really be not conscious of the Spirit, but conscious of Jesus. Conscious of the truth about Jesus. Conscious of what Jesus did and is doing in His sovereign control at the right hand of God over everything in your life so that you are full of the Spirit slash Christ. We can be under the influence of alcohol and of drugs and we become addicted. You know one addiction that seems to be rather prevalent in our circles? 21st birthday seems to be the right to get him drunk. what it's all about. Where's Jesus? Where's the Spirit of Christ? Another addiction. When we get together then we need a drink. Not just young, but older too. Can't go through the night without a glass. Two, three, a shot. Do you notice that if you're filled with the Spirit, one of the one of the fruits of that Spirit being in you full is that you do this. You speak one to another. Those are the very next words. You speak of the glory of God. You speak of what God has done for you. You have a relationship of great friendship and fellowship. You make melody in your hearts to the Lord. You give thanks always for all things. And you have a relationship that it's not I, 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 but it's what about you and can I help you and what's going on in your life and how can I be an encouragement? Submitting oneself one to another. Those verses that follow are the fruit of having the Spirit and being filled with the Spirit. So the calling is don't get addicted to drugs and alcohol wherein is waste, excess, inability to save, inability to control one's mind and one's will, but be filled with the Spirit so that your thinking and your willing is controlled by the Spirit of Jesus Christ. Now, that means this. First, that there is an awareness that I am a temple of the Holy Spirit and He is within. But that, that's at battle and that's at war with the nature 
that the Heidelberg Catechism describes as that against which I have to struggle all my life long. So that the presence of the Spirit within us in the book of Galatians chapter 5 is described this way. Walk, verse 16, walk in the Spirit and ye shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. And then he explains, For the flesh lusteth against the Spirit, and the Spirit against the flesh. And these are contrary the one to another, so that ye cannot do the things that ye would. But if ye be led of the Spirit, then you are not only not doing the lust of the flesh, but you are not under the law. For the works of the flesh are manif which are manifest are these. Oh, we know the list. And just about every list, as we noted in the men's Bible study, starts with adultery. Why? Because the flesh is in control of the mind and of the will. And not the spirit. So we're friends with benefits all of a sudden, immediately. And we give ourselves away. Adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lasciviousness, idolatry, witchcraft, or sorcery, hatred, variance, emulations, which are jealousies, wrath, strife. When do shootings take place? When do knives come out? When we're under the influence, not of the Spirit. Envyings, murders, drunkenness, revelings, and such like, of the which I tell you before. But the fruit of the Spirit is over against the lusts of the flesh. Verse 25, Galatians 5. If ye, walk, if ye live in the Spirit, let us also walk in the Spirit. Let us not be desirous of vain glory, provoking one another, envying one another. So the influence of the Spirit, being filled with the Spirit of Jesus Christ, is going to make us aware that there is that nature that is ours against which we have to struggle and we have to deny. And so one of the fruit of the Spirit is... What's the last, the ninth one? Self-control. Self-control. I can control and guide my thinking by the Spirit into the things of God. And my will, instead of my wanting to satisfy myself, to deny myself as a follower of Him who did nothing but deny Himself for me. We must not allow our desires and our feelings to take control. The Spirit must control us. We must deliberately reject all that would be contrary to Him and, and, and the desire to be busy in only those things which are of the earth. Literally, to be filled is that it takes possession of my mind. That's the idea. To realize that we have within us a comforter, the comforter. And he is always with us. And what he brings with him to us is the Spirit, is Christ, and the truth of Christ. He makes us think of Jesus Christ, what he paid, what he did, what he deserves from us in every situation. He's going to apply it 
this is this is when a wife realizes that her position in relation in a marriage is that which is given to her by Christ this is his institution how am i to live in it regardless of how he's acting sometimes Regardless of how he's hurt me, I'm controlled not by him, not by me, but by the Spirit of Christ. What it means to be a husband is that he loves and he gives. When she's unloving, that's when he really shows that he gets it. That's something only the Spirit can influence one to think and to conduct oneself correctly, to walk the way God would have us to walk. Every Sunday morning, I have the habit, and you've heard it, of giving the blessing that is at the very end of 2 Corinthians. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you. The communion, the communion of the Holy Spirit. You're communing with him, the Spirit of Christ. He's communicating to you. You're hearing him, and you're communicating to him. You're walking with him. How can two walk together unless they be agreed? You're under his influence. All you can do is think about Christ. That's what the work of the Spirit. And you commune with him, the communion of the Holy Spirit. May I say it, and may you hear it, not only this morning with a new ear, but may that be there all the rest of our life. Now God performs that act in His sovereign control, and God gives us the ability to do this. It's all of grace. But while it's all of grace, it's precisely something only those with given grace can do. An unbeliever cannot live constantly under the control of and in the consciousness of the Spirit of Christ within him. Only those who are saved can. But that knowledge of what God has done in His declaration about us in justification is exactly that which shows itself in a walk of holiness. Oh, we call it walk of sanctification. Walk of sanctification. It's a walk of holiness. It's a walk that's separated from the world and from self and flesh. It's a walk that's dedicated and devoted to the Lord, glory of God and to the gratitude to Jesus Christ. Now we will not, we will have a life then that will not fall itself into fornication, excess, revelings. Now there's a negative. But the wonder of the Holy Spirit of Jesus Christ is that it's not just negatives. There is. What are the fruit of the Spirit? Love. Love for God. A correct love for self. Right self-love. Where we see ourselves as the objects of God's love and we learn to love and see ourselves just the way that God does. In Christ. In 
then to love. We will not submit ourselves one to another unless we love one another. Joy. Rejoice in the Lord always. And again I say rejoice. That ability to rejoice always is because we know what we've been given. Undeservedly, but given in Christ. Forgiveness. Righteousness. So that so that when there's a death, a sudden death, I went to a funeral this week, of a sudden death, there's the family. They never expected it. New Year's Day, suddenly the husband, father, grandfather dies. To be, under the, to be filled with the Spirit, to be under the influence of the Spirit, is to know how to handle, how to deal with, how to know who did it. To not know why, but to trust. And to realize that my life is to be governed and influenced in such a way that I know I'm going home. I'm going to live this life. In every situation, can I go to hockey games? Absolutely, but I know how to do it. Can I go to work? Yes, but I'm not going to do it grudgingly, hating it. I'm going to do it under the influence of the Spirit with a joy. Peace. Peace. Love, joy, peace. There's a calm. Sure, there's controversy. But you walk into it knowing the Spirit of Christ is in control. In every situation, be filled with the consciousness of what God has done for you in Christ. That's what it means to be filled with the Spirit. Have fellowship with Him. Talk with Him. Commune with Him. And what he's going to do is give you the desire to listen to him. So you're going to go into the scriptures. You're going to be wanting to do his good pleasure in every part of your life. You're going to be the, there's going to be the promptings of the Spirit. You're going to heed those promptings. The more we obey, the more we're under his influence. The more we submit, we will be willingly controlled by that Spirit. Then we'll know what to do in the practical parts of our life. This is not an option. And this is not just a Sunday thing. And this is not just something for the first Sunday of the year. Now we can set it aside. This is a command in the present tense. This is to be a constant activity on the part of the child of God who's gifted with the Spirit, who now then can be filled. You know how to fill yourself with, with alcohol. You know how to be filled with the wrong things. You can be filled with pornography. Fill your mind. No. No. Be filled with the Spirit. The Spirit of Jesus Christ. Fill yourself. You can. They can't. It's the grace that enables you to do that. Now do it. And then you're going to know what to be as fathers and as mothers. Those little children. And you found that out with Isaiah. They're not yours. They're not. 
He gives and He takes. And He wants us to say, Blessed be His name. He wants you to live your life so influenced that when you deal with those little children, you want them to learn to love and rejoice in Him. And so for all of us, Amen. Our Father, we thank Thee. Thou dost come to us in a very powerful way. We're struck by how well Thou dost know us. We're embarrassed. We're ashamed at the influence that we can give to the things of this flesh. Those can be sins that are characteristic of the youth, but it may not be. Bless our youth that they will not be so influenced by the flesh and the desires of the flesh so that they have to pray, forgive me for the sins of my youth. But may we all live striving constantly to live in the consciousness of the gift of salvation that is ours in Jesus and walk carefully, accordingly. For Jesus' sake, amen.